Recently, an Islamic website urged its followers to see where you are and where you are uh, wh- to see where you are and where you want to go Islamically as they enter this new year. If followers of the dead and buried Prophet Muhammad are thinking about how to live with purpose in 2019, how much more reason do followers of the living Christ, the risen Lord Jesus, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, have to live redeeming the time because the days are evil? Ephesians 5:16. I believe that doing so at this time, writes Franklin Graham, in our nation involves standing strong for life and exercising the privileges of our citizenship to speed the confirmation of pro-life judges. The November election saw Democrats gain control of the U.S. House of Representatives, while Republicans solidified their majority in the Senate, 53 to 47. That was the election of 2018. For months I had called on Christians, writes Franklin Graham, across our nation to study the candidates and their stance on key moral issues and to cast their ballots for those who most closely aligned with biblical principles. By all accounts, Christians went to the polls in solid numbers. This development in the Senate holds great promise for protecting life. By God's grace, we still have a brief window of opportunity to see a seismic shift in one of the defining issues of our time, the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling that legalized abortion nationally. Major strides in the composition of the Supreme Court have already been made with the appointments of Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, but as additional seats on the court became vacant, the battle to seat pro-life judges will be fierce. For those who watched the chaotic confirmation hearings for Kavanaugh, it was clear that forces opposing him were largely comprised of ardent pro-abortion advocates. They understood that, for the first time in decades, the Supreme Court would have a clear 5-4 conservative majority that could present a serious threat to Roe. Overturning Roe is a matter of great importance, not only because life is precious to God, who is its giver, but because our modern-day slaughter of the innocents has robbed our nation of enormous human treasure. Since Roe, nearly 60 million innocent babies have been murdered in their mother's wombs. That's enough, of humans being, that's enough human beings to populate our four largest cities, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Dallas. As 2019 begins, and any other year for that matter, we need a renewed outpouring of prayer, asking not only God's forgiveness for this sinful plague that has blemished our land for so long, but also asking for his empowering to bring an end to the slaughter brought on by Roe versus Wade. What kind of people kill and destroy their own offspring? Like the human sacrifices of some pagan cultures, thousands of unborn are offered up every day on the altars of pleasure and convenience. As my mother used to say, writes Franklin Graham, if God doesn't judge America, he will need to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, that's an oxymoron because God never does anything wrong. He's the perfect one. This evil in our land will not be defeated easily. In the past few months, federal courts have struck down laws in Kentucky and Mississippi that would have limited abortions. These judges defied the will of the people in those states whose government sought to protect the unborn. Thankfully, Alabama and Georgia have now taken strides against abortion. But these cases of going against life will likely be appealed and could eventually reach the Supreme Court in um, cases where they are promoting abortions, abortions. And if they reach the Supreme Court with this conservative majority, we could undo the damage and continue the trend of Alabama and Georgia to stop abortions. More tests for Roe v. Wade could come from the November elections, where Alabama and West Virginia also voted to restrict abortions. What an opportunity we have now with a conservative majority in the U.S. Senate at this time, which must confirm or reject all federal judicial nominees. Think of the potential safeguards that can be enacted for the sake of life, religious liberty, and other moral issues if conservative judges become the majority in federal, district, and state courts. The the Trump administration has already filed more than 80 federal judicial slots, yet there are still well over 100 others awaiting confirmation at the moment. If we don't want the express will of our citizens routinely overridden by left-wing judicial activists who are hostile to the Christian gospel and refuse to extend any protection to people of faith, then these vacant judgeships must be filed quickly, and filled quickly. The more conservative judges we have, the greater the chance for ordinary citizens to live and work by a biblically informed conscience, which brings freedom. However, as we do all we can do, salt and light in our decaying culture, 
as we do all we can to be salt and light in our decaying culture, we must remember that we are first and foremost citizens of another world. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20 Yes, we are earthly citizens as well, but our ultimate allegiance is to the Lord himself if we know him as Savior. We are in the world, but not of it. As a friend of mine recently reminded me, writes, Billy Graham, uh, writes of Franklin Graham, we are a people of the book, a people of the blood, and a people of the blessed hope. We are a people of the book, meaning the Bible, if we know Jesus as Savior. And we've been born again. I begin most every day by spending time reading the, the scriptures, the Bible. I love it, especially the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which describe the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love all of the Bible because it is God's divinely inspired word to mankind. 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 authors, who are basically secretaries for the main author, the Lord himself, the Holy Spirit. There's nothing else like it in the world. It guides, counsels, and comforts us, convicting us of sin and our need for a Savior. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. As Charles Spurgeon once said, Nobody ever outgrows scripture. The book widens and deepens with our ears. We are also people of the blood. It is the scarlet thread of redemption that runs straight through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. As the hymn says, we can, What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In the scripture, the blood of Jesus always refers to the death of Jesus for our sins. Jesus came to die. He came to die for the forgiveness of our sin, for the wrath of God to be poured out on his only son, the equal son of God, eternal, almighty, so that we could repent and receive the gift of eternal life that he paid fully and completely. It is Christ in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1.14. And always, we are the people of the blessed hope, the soon coming of our Lord and Savior. Christ has come, but that's not the end of it. He's a coming again, this time as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, ready to set up his millennial kingdom and usher in new heavens and a new earth. Just read Revelation. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin. That is, we will not be covered in sin at that time when he raptures us out because we'll have already been born again and now fully complete in a new body. We'll be able to see him face to face. And it says for salvation, ultimately, total salvation as we are found placed in heaven, completely safe forevermore. Uh, that is a commentary I added in with the verse from Hebrews nine twenty seven to 28. Now the heartfelt cry, come Lord Jesus, in Revelation twenty two twenty is always on the lips of the saint. That is, the believer, the born again Christian. Throughout the coming year, I'll be proclaiming that hope, right, writes Franklin Graham, preaching the gospel in Thailand, Australia, Colombia, Belarus, and Cambodia. We'll bring our Decision America tour to the Northeast with stops in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. And we will be doing much more at the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte on the internet and through all our other gospel outreaches. I pray that 2019, or this year that you are watching this video, will be for you a year of standing for life and living for heaven. Make it your purpose to live daily as a man or woman of the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. Give Jesus the preeminence in your life that he demands and deserves, and overcome evil with good, Romans twelve twenty one. And as my father used to say, writes Franklin Graham, may God bless you, real good. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can accept him right now, because the Bible says in Romans three twenty three, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Ephesians 2.8-9 through 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 2, uh, uh, 10, Romans 10, 9 says, if, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just right now, talk to God and say, what do you believe? Do you believe? I mean, do you believe? Do you want to be saved? Admit to him that you know you're a sinner, that you deserve the penalty, the punishment for sin, but that you know and believe that God, the Son of God himself, equal with the Father and Spirit, died in your place 
and rose again. Ask him to be your savior and forgive you forever.